from Flourish DX School, this is the Flourishing at School podcast. With mental health becoming a global priority, we are your partner for creating schools where students, teachers and school leaders feel good and function well, becoming the best versions of themselves and contributing to a flourishing world. Welcome to the Flourishing at School podcast. I'm Tamara Lechner. Each week, we bring you the best practitioners, academics, and everything in between in order to inform whole school mental health. I am delighted to have just returned from the SEL in Action conference. This is a conference celebrating educators doing great things in the social emotional learning space. And I am so energized. And my guest today was also in attendance, we were there together. So this conference was hosted by Education First and supported by the Novo Foundation. And I am going to start by introducing Micah J. Wanjun Kessel, and I'll let you, let him tell you a bit about himself in a moment. But Micah, if you have a one word summary of how you felt returning from that conference, what, what would your word be? I think driven. <laughs> driven, I uh, love that. Yeah, yeah. To be to be really transparent, I think the um, you know the work in K through twelve education is one that requires an enormous amount of drive. Obviously, right? And um, just being close to three hundred and fifty educators over the course of two days that probably don't attend conferences as much as people in the organizational world do, and seeing how on the, you know, just how boots on the ground they are about their work. Just, it's such a motivator to, and such a driver of, of wanting to make the same impact um, together. Yeah, I love that. That's a, a good word choice. I, I think I would have chosen something like lifted. So we're, we're driven and lifted and that's a, that's a great way for us to start this conversation. <laughs> so yeah. I'm proud to call Micah my friend. Micah is in my humble opinion, the king of the empathy experience. And I was introduced to Micah um, through a mutual friend who is also the founder of a startup. And Micah has a group called Empathable. And I'm going to let him really fill you in. But what I can tell you about Micah is he has worked advising empathy experiences with groups like Google, Disney, Microsoft. He is a researcher, but he's also a hands-on practitioner. And that's really why I love his work. Because when I first spoke with Micah, he really talked about making powerful change. So the research is great, but seeing the research in action and seeing change happen, that's where I see the magic. And I think that's something Micah and I had in common. So Micah, welcome to the Flourishing at School podcast. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is in five minutes or less, tell our audience who you are, what you do, and why you started. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Tamara. It's, it's really lovely to, to be in community with you as we were, as you mentioned, in Austin and, and in this moment together now. It feels like just 10 seconds ago that we were <laughs> um, standing in the Ellsworth Kelly art, uh, art installation in downtown Austin, flooded with light and beautiful paintings. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still holding that light inside of me. Um, yeah, in terms of an introduction, I feel like you've already done it beautifully. Um, I, I guess a few other things that I'll, I'll say about myself before I talk about our work is that, um, you know, I'm someone who's spent a life adapting to different cultures. I'm myself from different cultures, right? I have a Korean mother, a Jewish father, uh, grew up in New York, Connecticut, um, Hamburg, Germany, in San Francisco, in Amsterdam, in Belgium. Um, these are all places that I call home in many ways. And when home and for, you know, those of you out there, and I'm sure there are many that can relate to this when your home exists from more than one place, when your home exists from being from multiple places, um, the, the idea of, of adaptation at best and code switching, I guess, in, in the more challenging sense, um, is, is something that becomes, uh, either a second nature or something you really need to cultivate. And I think I've spent a lot of my life trying to cultivate that second nature in a way that still allowed me to be authentic to myself, which hasn't always been easy. Um, so 
you know, I, I think that that's a big part of who I am. Um, and I think that it feeds really well into the types of work that I've done in, in the space of empathy so far. Um, because, um, you know, essentially what, what empathable is doing. So what, what I do and what we do, I found recently a really simple way to say it, which is that we recreate real memories, um, which sounds like kind of a very sci-fi tech thing to do. And sure, there is a tech component, but recreating real memories of people through point of view, immersive media experiences, um, is really cool. <laughs> it's, it's really cool to watch because you get this opportunity to walk into someone's shoes, um, in a way that goes way beyond just the, the adage, the expression of it and really moves into, um, an authentic, um, ability to feel into your own experience of what it would be like to be them. Now, of course, we'll never know how anyone else feels and, you know, we'll never really be able to truly walk in anyone else's shoes, but having the emotional experience that comes close to it is a very emotional and impactful thing. And we learn through those emotions. Um, we all know the expression we learn in life through experience, but somehow in K through 12 and, you know, beyond and, and, you know, even in institutional learning, we teach in life so much through concepts instead of through experience. So empathable is really all about answering this question of what happens when we start teaching people through emotional experiences that bring us into the conversation, help us relate to it, help us understand it in our own special way and help us celebrate the validity of our own experience to be as valid as that person's that we're experiencing, but also help acknowledge that their experience is as valid as ours and kind of move up that ladder one, one foot at a time. Um, because that's the only way you can climb ladders. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, this is so important for K through 12 learning because, um, the social emotional component of, of community building, if that's not there, then all of the other, you know, performance level, questions just fall completely to the wayside. And I think that explains, you know, the really low, um, low performance that we have in so many of the, the box checking areas. Um, and I, I think that, you know, solving it without having a program for building empathy, connection and belonging in our schools is, is going to be a, a battle that can never be won. Um, so the last thing I'll say, cause I know five minutes is probably up is, you know, we're trying to answer the question, what happens when an entire school can walk in each other's shoes, teachers, faculty, uh, right, staff, parents, mm -hmm. and students, if they could all walk in each other's shoes, what kind of school would that be? I love that question. And I wanna take us back just a fraction. Uh, and can we lay the groundwork, starting with a common language, what do you mean specifically when you say the word empathy? Let's start on, a, on mm. the same page for everybody. Yeah. So this is something that I think about, um, quite a bit because we all, you know, it's empathy is a relatively new word as some of you might know, in, you know, in, in the body of language, um, in the dictionary, it's generally defined as understanding how someone feels. <clears throat> and that's a, a faulty definition because we'll never understand how someone feels. Um, even understanding our own feelings can be challenging. Um, uh, and those change over time, right? So it, it's not a good definition really. Um, well, how we define empathy at Empathable is at, at the best, the celebration of someone else's experience being as valid as our own. And when we can't celebrate it because we just, we just can't, um, it's the acknowledgement of someone else's experience being as valid as our own and letting life do the rest, you know, in the sense that if you're having an experience and I take time to acknowledge it as valid. It doesn't mean I have to agree with it. It doesn't even mean that I have to engage with it, but it does mean that if I sleep on it, if I go out into the world and see other experiences that help inform why you have that perception of your own experience, then I might actually grow from that. In a great example that we have in our, in our library of point of view, immersive experiences, is um, there's a moment when um, that talks about um, how people 
of different genders and races take up space differently on the sidewalk. And when we share this scene, there's a whole array of different responses to it. I would say by and large, um, women and certainly black women will remark and say, yeah, this is something that I, I'm very aware of, or it's something that I experience all the time. People do not move out of the way for me on the sidewalk. A lot of times, you know, men, um, often, you know, also white men will, will be less aware of this experience. Um, and if you, if you ask folks, you know, what did you think about that point of view recreated memory that we were watching right now of someone not moving out of the way, the, the knee jerk reaction, right. Is to say, well, I mean, I, I know I move out of the way, right? Like, I, I, you know, I'm, it's not me. I, I'm surprised. It's not, yeah. It's not me. It's not me. Um, when we follow up and we check in, we notice by and large that people will say things like, you know, I actually, I've been more aware of the space I take when I walk down the street and I can tell you, you know, I'm not immune <laughs> to this learning either. I noticed that when I walk down the street, um, I'm much more aware of, of the moments when I get it wrong. You know, the moments when I could have moved out of the way and I'm a little bit too late. And I just notice out of the corner of my eye, a look on someone's face sometimes. And I think, oops, yeah, I, I, I missed that opportunity to, to, you know, find equity in the way that I even moved down the street. Right. And if, if that's like an example of the smallest thing, then, you know, this, this times a hundred times a day is our lives. And that, that's what where belonging lives or die by, dies by. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And personally, the first time that I experienced one of Empathable's point of view walks, one of the things that really stood out to me as a white straight woman was there were things in the experiences that I would just never have had awareness of if I hadn't had that walk in someone else's shoes. But I think the even more powerful part for me was it took it out of a cognitive experience. You could write me a story and have me read about it, but it's very, very different when you are immersed in this point of view and you're seeing the experience from the eyes of someone who's different than you. And so I was very struck by uh, one walk that I did of a black woman talking about being ashy and I didn't even know ashy was a thing. And, and so yep. again, it's little tiny baby steps towards understanding. And of course I can never be in a black woman's shoes, but it gave me an insight that I can think about differently. And so this was part of the reason that I jumped on board as such a massive fan of this work. It takes it out of your head and into your body. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that, that ashy example actually, because, you know, it, it, as Tamara's, you know, as you're saying, like there is a scene that, you know, where she talks about, um, never wanting to walk out of the house looking ashy. And when we share this scene, people of color um, who, you know, have experienced ashiness will often laugh. They'll often be like, oh, my God, I can't believe she said that. Or like, yeah, I've never heard someone talk about this out loud. And what, what I think they're meaning is like outside of our community. And I yeah. will see people being brought in to a cultural conversation that delivers warmth. It delivers warmth in the same way that talking about, you know, Korean food for me or soul food, right. Or, or a food of a culture, like food can bring us together in such amazing ways, you know, and it's, it's, you know, some people might not consider talking about food, a work on inclusion or work on belonging or work on empathy, but it is, it absolutely is. And it's, it's a pathway that works. Right? Yeah. It was very interesting. So at the conference that Micah and I, attended, they had two students come and speak to us. And we asked them a lot of hard questions because we wanted their voice in the room. It really mattered. And one of the questions they were asked was what they would recommend in order to create a more inclusive environment. And that food and dress and allowing them to have the opportunity to share their history and their background was powerful and, and you realize that those things like food and clothing really matter deeply. The other nugget that I took home that, that those two shared with us 
is a two word nugget. What do they want from the adults? Do better. And so this brings me to my next question because I think Empathable is doing empathy work better. Could you tell me again, people have been trying to do this and we're learning from our mistakes. So what has been going wrong with empathy work that we're working to build back better? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what hasn't been going wrong? It, it, sometimes <laughs> it feels like, you know, I think, and I'm not saying that even for me, you know, I'm saying that this, that message goes out to the hearts of everyone out there listening who's tried to, you know, really improve um, the empathy of their environments and just see nothing work. I mean, I, I just came out of a meeting just now with someone who's in the UK, you know, not even in the US context and just talking about how every single thing that he has tried has not worked. And, you know, it's so hard when you get that feeling. It's such a painful feeling to be like, we're investing dollars, you know, um, we're investing time, we're investing energy, and we're just, we're not seeing any changes. So it's a really tough um tough situation when that's the case. And, and the science backs up that, you know, that that change is not happening the way we want it to. Um, I think the reasons why, well, what I mentioned, right, is that we learn in life through experience, but we teach in life through concept. We need to start teaching in life through experience. I think that's a big one. You know, 75% of DEI, diversity and inclusion programs also use negative messaging to get their point across. And the last time that someone, you know, told me to do something in a negative way, I can tell you that I was probably defensive about it. Um, so, you know, I don't know why we don't expect also people, other people to be defensive about it, even, and it's, you know, it's, it's like the Esther, I've said this before, but it really is like the Esther Perel quote, you know, you can be right or you can be married. And I think we focus a lot on being right, but it's not necessarily keeping us married or it's not keeping us together. And that's because we don't, you know, the, the, how often have you been in an argument and you've been standing up for the thing that you're standing up for. And then the next, you know, five minutes later or an hour later, or sometimes it takes a year, but eventually you think, you know, I actually see the other person's point, right? And then you change and the person that wanted you to see that point won't necessarily get to witness that, but that's how we work. We need to sleep on it. We need to have other conversations for change to happen. So that brings me to the other reason that, that programs are so effective is because coming in once for an expensive quarterly training and then expecting people to change from that is, is you know, it, it's, it's not realistic. We don't, that's not how we change. We don't, you know, win a marathon by, um, you know, leaving our house one day and, you know, running as hard and fast as we can for as long as we can. It, it's a, it's a slow drip and that's, you know, why Empathable shares these little mini vignettes that you can do like once a day um, that don't feel like curriculum. You know, they don't feel like a need to do. They feel like a get to do. They should feel like a treat. Um, and I think the last thing that I would say is actually, it came up, you use this word so many times just now, which is um, sharing, you know, like uh, sharing is caring. And what I mean by that is just this weekend, we, we, um, had 200 sorority, um, young women walk in the shoes of a, of a student at their school. Um, and it was a Sunday at 6 PM Eastern. And so you can imagine, you know, during the semester, how 200 young women felt about going through an hour and a half, you know, in, inclusion and belonging and empathy training on a Sunday at 6 PM, the emotions that they shared in the beginning of the experience by and large were tired, overwhelmed, anxious, and by and large at the end, we get a lot of hungries because, you know, the experience makes you process a lot, but also hopeful, you know, and grateful and curious. And that emotional shift is really important. And it happens, you know, after the session, you never know how these things go, right? Because I'm, I'm only one person. So we asked the president of this sorority, how did she think it went? And she said, in all of the trainings that we have shared over years, we have never had this much participation. People have never interacted so much. So that's what I mean by sharing is caring. Like we need in order, you know, something's effective when people are talking, when you're not the only one in the room presenting. Yeah. 
I could not agree with you more. And I've seen that when you present either in person or online, uh, there is this fabulous dialogue that's opened. It starts the individual thinking, but it starts the community talking. And these are all good things. I'm going to shift lanes a little bit because we talked about, okay, what was going wrong with empathy that caused some change and has, has you and Empathable experimenting with maybe better ways. And I want to shift and talk about something that you've come up with that I think is quite unique and I'll call it the concept of two in a room. And I'm wondering, uh, if you could explain a little bit about that. I know it's, it's a, hard thing for you to sum up quickly, but I think especially in this day and age when we're, we're seeing people really at far ends of the spectrum, um, the pendulum is swinging back and forth between two really disparate ideas and people are struggling to find common ground. And I believe that two in the room is the way to do it. So could you explain that to our audience? Yeah, absolutely. And really gladly. Um, you know, so we talk to a lot of folks who are trying to make change, really good hearted people. You know, I like to say that most people out there want us all to get along and want to make change. To be honest, I think sometimes maybe only the first one's true. Like, of course we don't, it would great, you know, but I don't, I don't think everybody wants to make change and that's okay. Like no one said that we all need to be wanting to make change. You know, we're all allowed to have our own experiences, but for those who do want to make change, One of the most typical responses I get when they are moved by this experience that Empathable offers is, I really love this. And I know some of my colleagues would love this as well. But what do I do about the people who are not going to want to show up? What do I do about the people who, you know, are problematic for me and have been giving me trouble? What do I do about the most biased people? And it's always a moment that is a little disheartening because scientifically speaking, we know the answer to that question. What do you do about those people? And the answer is really simple, but it might not be the, the, you know, crowd favorite, but it is, it is the truth, I believe. Um, and, and social science backs that up. And that is that in order to create a radical, shift in our environments towards more empathy, we need to stop focusing on the most explicitly biased people and the people who bother us the most. We focus on them because they bother us the most, because they are the reports to HR, right? They are the, the, they keep us up at night, emotionally speaking. And we think they're never going to change. And that's, you know, the anti-hope. But on the other end of the spectrum, next to the people who are the outspoken advocates, right? The DEI folks, the folks that read books that want to speak up are the people who are motivated to speak up, but they don't know how we call those the almost allies. You can even call them the allies if you want. These are the people that have shown up to employee resource group meetings. They've shown up to school board meetings. They're also reading books. They're asking their friends and, you know, back in 2020, tell me what I need to do to be more supportive, supportive of Black Lives Matter. They are, they have the will, but they do not know how to be the second person in the room that knows how to speak up. They don't know how to do that yet. The way for them to be able to do so is be by gaining this emotional exposure to other people's experiences. That's why Empathable does what we do. And the result of doing so is that you get two people in every room who become comfortable and willing to speak up for the rights of others. And the amazing thing about getting two people in every room is that if you have one person, that person feels like a squeaky wheel, right? They feel like they're the bad person and they continually be judged and it's disheartening. When you get two people, you get a conversation partner. And once that second person happens, right? Once that conversation begins, it shifts the environment. And the third person in the room, the well-meaning empath, as I mentioned before, that wants us all to get along, but doesn't know why we don't get along. They're much more open-minded because they feel closer to the almost ally than they do to the outspoken advocate anyway. And then the 
bi- person who's a little bit biased or quite biased and trying to justify it, but they have no idea. Sorry, the person who's quite biased, but they have no idea. They actually understand the well-meaning empath better than they understand the almost ally. So it's like a domino effect, right? You're pulling people towards a deeper understanding and deeper empathy by getting the person who is closest to them in their way of thinking to become more empathic, to have more belonging. But you don't start by over-focusing all the way at the end of the spectrum. Instead, you start by the second person in the room. Because the first person in the room is already speaking up. They're already doing their job. We need to actually stop asking them to do more because they're tired. They're doing enough, right? Every DEI or you know empathy person out there who's working really hard to do it, I know that you're trying really hard and my heart goes out with you. It's the people out there that don't realize the power that they have by being that second person in the room and speaking up. And those are the people that if we can get them, that second person in the room to start speaking up, then we can create radical change without needing to change the radicals. And that's, that's what environmental shifts are all about. That's the real solution. It's not focusing on the person who's driving us crazy. It's focusing on the second person in the room who's comfortable and willing to speak up and getting them to actually speak up. I love that. And I love the statement of creating radical change without changing the radicals. Because if you think of energy expended, so much energy is required so much effort is required for that person at the far opposite side of the room, way less energy is expended. Just embracing and educating the people who are closer to you. And I think I always think of it like snowflakes dropping onto a branch. Sometimes it feels like we're never going to break that branch, but if enough snowflakes (laughs) <laughs> are aligned in the same spot, the branch does come down and then you've got your radical change uh, without having to do any radical action. So it's it's a, a brilliant visual. I love it. Yeah, one of the best analogies I think we have in the United States is gay marriage, you know, because there was a time when um, most people in the United States were against gay marriage. And then at some point, everybody realized that they have an uncle or a cousin or a friend or someone they know that's gay. And they have that genuine, authentic connection, that emotional connection to the concept, right, of sexual orientation in a different way than they have envisioned it before. And that concept stopped being a concept. It started being a lived experience. And then almost overnight, viewpoints in the United States on gay marriage changed and an overwhelming of over 70% of Americans were pro-gay marriage. And that's how the policy shifted and that's how the changes shifted. Before that moment, I don't think anyone could have predict- predicted that. But what happens, you got a lot of second people in a room who, are, you know, who thought, well, wait a second, you know, my, my, uh, my best friend's gay. Like, of course I'm going to speak up for that person. And that's why in order for two in the room to happen, We need to be exposed to different experiences or be connected to different experiences besides our own in a meaningful way. That's challenging to do when so many of our environments are so homogenous. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I was very filled with hope when I heard that research. And one of the posits of why that change has come around that I've heard thrown back and forth is that it's the generation that my grandparents want to be more open to their grandchildren than perhaps to their own children. And so that generation of, okay, we've had some time to think about this and we, we really love our grandchild. And, and so I think when we start to walk in these shoes and see the grandchildren and the cousins and understand that we are more alike than we are different, that that change will happen. And so absolutely, this is inspiring to see that in really two generations, we've gone from very little support to overwhelming support. And it it does give hope when I know often that lonely person trying to create change um, can feel less filled with hope and support. And, And so looking at these figures that are telling us this does work is really something that I like to hold on to. So that's going to bring me into my next question because our audience 
love research, love learning. Uh, we are a podcast that shares academic and, and other podcasts and books. So I'm curious, where do you go when you are interested to learn something new? Do you have podcasts, books, other resources that are, that are your go-tos? <laughs> Um, well, it depends on, I, I guess, what the type of, of learning is that I'm looking for. If we're talking about, you know, I think that, that I mean, I know there's research from, so, I, you know, I'm, I have a science practitioner partnership with the Center for the Science of Moral Understanding at UNC Chapel Hill. That's a really fancy way of saying that I get to, you know, learn and, you know, got to go to a conference recently of people that are a lot smarter than I am and certainly in their fields when it comes to understanding how, you know, approaches to depolarization, approaches to, um, you know, moving the needle on a national scale um, and looking at certain emotional concepts that can do that and social concepts. One such concept is the idea that um, if you have two political opponents and they're spouting data at each other, you know, that the chances of the, those opponents actually believing the other's stories to be true are very low. But when they share stories anecdotally, um, then the chances go way up, right? So if we're talking about gun control, for example, and I tell you X percentage of you know, accidents in, in the home happen from a Y percentage of people who um, do not have a, when, did not go through proper licensing you know, you might nod your head at that, but if, if you're, you know, of a different viewpoint and don't want to really hear that person, it's really easy to not hear them. If I tell you that, you know, I had a friend and I, this is a story I'm making up right now, just for the record. Right. But if you didn't know that, right. And I said, if I had a friend who, you know, was, um, injured for life through gun violence, um, and the gun that injured that person was, was from, someone that didn't have a proper license, um, you know, and this happens all the time. And why percentage of people in the world are actually injured from guns that don't have proper licenses? Starting from that anecdote is so powerful. So I love social science research, and, and I think it's really important to know how to pair the data with, with uh, real storytelling, right? But, I, you know, even, even just spouting off, like, you know, 97% of employees believe in the U.S. believe empathy is essential for a healthy workplace culture. 70% uh, of employees would be willing to work longer hours for an empathetic employer. Um, you know, employees who thought their boss lacked emotional intelligence are 38% more likely to have high turnover intentions. You know, and I can give you the, the research of all those three points of data later on. Um, I think this stuff is really inspiring to know because it allows us to design um, conscious of, of the power of what empathy can do in organizations and also to do pre and post evaluations in these experiences that really impact people. So that's, that's my very, you know, social science nerd, um, answer for you. But I think that, you know, the, the bigger answer is that, um, that, you know, learning comes from, from all different places. I think most of all, it comes from, um, the, the moments, one of our, Anna, our, our colleague, right, who was with us in um, just now in Austin, something that she's maybe one of my favorite compliments um, that I've ever received from someone. My absolute favorite com compliment is from my friend Megami, who says she re I remind her of Hobbes, the tiger and Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> that right. is a great compliment. <laughs> That's my compliment. No one's going to beat that. I dare someone to try. I'll be happy to stand there and listen to them try <laughs> to give me a better compliment. But um, Anna's compliment is one that I, I really take to heart, which she said, you know, Micah, I, I don't know anyone who takes criticism as well as you do. Um, I don't know if my own internal emotional experience of that aligns with what she's perceiving always. I think it's, it can be hard, obviously. But, um, but I think that's the best teacher. Is, and that's the thing about empathy and belonging and inclusion, is if you don't create a psychologically safe environment, or let's just say an environment of trust, then no one's ever going to tell you what they really think. And if they don't tell you what they really think, how are you going to grow? So this is what we need in our schools. We need a place where, you know, teachers don't feel like the be all end all of knowing things and students don't feel like their teachers don't want to listen to them. We need just the opposite. We need them to walk in each other's shoes and to be able to have conversations where 
they're really hearing each other on a very, very basic emotional level. So if I distill that answer down to its sweetness, you learn from mm -hmm. other people. It doesn't matter who they are. So there's the yep. big thinkers at UNC Chapel Hill and there's the guy on the street. And when we are open-minded and curious, we're learning from all of them. Yeah. Yeah. There's like every moment can be a learning moment. And the ones that are often the, the most painful, as we all know, can be sometimes the biggest learning moments. But, you know, in a, in a world of cancel culture um, and where, you know, especially in the United States, we're all so afraid of, of being attacked um, in social media. And certainly, you know, Gen Z and, and younger people than Gen Z are, are, you know, rightfully so, so afraid of being attacked. Um, it's really hard to, to allow those hard moments to be growing moments. Um, you know, I want to live in a world where we can be um, really honest with each other, but know that that honesty is, is there to help and, and not to harm. Um, and gosh, you know, if that were the case, I wonder if we'd be in the state that we're in now in our schools. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh unfortunately we don't get to know, but let's hope we get there and find out. We're working on it, aren't we? <laughs> we <laughs> are. And around. so that again, segues perfectly into the final question. I like to ask our guests uh, because we're called the flourishing at school podcast. Flourishing is kind of the place we want to get to where humans feel good, function well and contribute meaningfully to their community or school community. So given the work that you do, if everything went really well and you walked into a school that had been using Empathable a year from now, what would be different? How would you know that this school was flourishing? Hmm. That's a beautiful question. Um, yeah, if I were to not intellectualize that question and just answer from a heart centered place, um, then I think stepping into that imagined future would be about a vibe. Um, you know, my intellectual part wants to say, you know, in social science, we call those group norms, right? But it, it really is about a vibe. It's about um, intellectual humility, which means, again, the, the simple way to say that it's pausing. It's, it's taking space before feeling like you need to respond. Um, and so, you know, something that to kind of like loop back around to the beginning of our conversation, something that I learned from living in all of these different cultures is that when two people walk up to each other on the street that know each other in the United States, there's often, um, and this isn't a criticism, this is just an observation, Right. But there's often this very big boisterous, Hey, like, right. Like this, these big emotional gestures that express that enthusiasm and excitement. Um, and it's very fast, right? People hold out their hands to shake someone's hand, you know, 10 steps before they've actually <laughs> gotten to see or, or like in front of each other. And, you know, there are places in the world where it's very different, obviously, if we're talking about a vibe, um, some of those, you know, Iceland, um, Riga in Latvia, Berlin. Uh, these are places that where I've experienced that people will walk up to each other that know each other and they'll say nothing. And the first thing that they'll do is they'll stand there and they'll look in each other's eyes. And then, you know, after a beat, they'll say something like, Hey, you know, and it's like allowing the experience that we share if, if empathy, again, is if the redefinition of empathy is about the idea that we are all having valid experiences and none of us are concepts, right? We are all experiencing life together. Then by that definition, the moment of our togetherness is a shared experience. So how can schools look and feel like everyone's having a shared experience? And, you know, how can everyone walking in each other's shoes and having these aha moments and having time to process before being told what to think or what to do, never being told what to think or what to do, actually. So it's all self-learning. Um, you know, how could that massive walking in each other's shoes create that kind of vibe where people are 
leaning into their shared experiences together and where we're not looking for right answers when it comes to people because people aren't concepts to be answered. People are experiences to be experienced. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's a future that will allow the, those who are the most marginalized, but also those who are the most privileged to be able to all feel included in the same conversation and actually help each other have collective flourishing. Um, so that's, that's my dream. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm there with you and I think that you're going to be part of making it happen. I really do. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now I know our audience are going to want to connect with you and I know you're on LinkedIn. Jason and I hang out on LinkedIn and we'll be popping some clips from this episode there, but where else would you want our audience who are curious to know more about having empathy? empathable join them in their school or their organization uh where can they find you yeah so i would say that you know the best place to go is truly empathable.com right empath able you can look at it like that but empathable.com um and you know to fill out a form and reach us that way it sounds really traditional but we're a, a small team that tries to be um present in every conversation and we don't assume we have all the answers in fact we assume we don't and that we need to be co-designing the perfect experience um, that really fits the culture of the particular schools that we're working with and so yeah the best thing to do is to reach out to us through empathable.com and we'll find some time to share one of these you know walks one of these moments in the empathable journey um, that can mean that you end up getting a demo of the app so you can do one walk per day with a group of teachers or you know administration or teachers and admin uh, it could mean that we are sharing a heritage month session you know um, aapi month uh, asian american pacific islander heritage month is coming up in may and we have a really brilliant session available um, for may we also have a great pride month session for june so i think you know it can be a very time sensitive thing or it can be a hey, we want to try this out and, and see how we can make it fit into our school in a way that doesn't feel, again, like curriculum and doesn't feel like yet another thing that we have to do, but feels like something that we get to enjoy. Um, that's our goal. So that's, that's the best way to reach out to us. Perfect. Um, and I will just say for our very global audience that if your months don't align with the months that Micah mentioned, the concepts all still translate. So you may be thinking about that population at a different time of the year. Uh, although these can happen on American cadence. It's also a very global concept. So it works both ways. Yeah. And the, I mean, the last thing I'll say about that, right, is they're not only about heritage months. They're also, you know, we have sessions on how to give feedback. Well, sessions on how to have one on ones. Um, and again, not bullet point and concept sessions, but walk into other people's shoes and see how other people did feedback and one on ones and develop your own style of giving feedback and having one on ones. And that's, that's our approach. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm so grateful that you've shared your time with us today, Micah. That is it for this episode of the Flourishing at School podcast. If you're listening to us, don't forget, you can always pop over and see us on the Flourish DX YouTube channel. And as always, feel free to connect with Jason and I on our LinkedIn pages. Until then, keep flourishing in school and in life. You've been listening to the Flourishing at School podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on whole school mental health, follow Flourish DX School on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Flourishing at School podcast at www.flourishingatschool.com. 